we want to provide care that's flexible and individually tailored to, to patients' needs and we want to support them as far as they can go in their, in their journey to re towards recovery. And one of the things that our patients often say about us is that we don't give up on them. We want to look at the patient, patient as an individual and to try to meet um, his or her needs. So um, we cater for both male and female patients in both our units. Some of our patients come from a long way away and we need to make uh, adaptations about um, visiting or about uh, leave to go home and that, those sorts of things as well as working with their, with their carers. Um, Patients may have a variety of other mental health problems um, which we need to be flexible in, in helping them to manage as well as physical problems. So we have had patients with a variety um, of um, physical illnesses, uh, some of which are connected with the eating disorder but, but may, uh, others which may not be. Most of our inpatient admissions are for severe anorexia nervosa. So patients may be quite physically frail, um, may have been eating very little or nothing before they come into hospital. Uh, sometimes we have um, admissions for, for patients who want to get control of uncontrolled vomiting or binging or something, but usually it's anorexia nervosa which brings people into hospital. Um, if patients are a little um, uh, less low in weight, then they can, may be able to be treated as a day patient provided they can access the unit um, and get there safely and so on, uh, because often they're not fit to, to drive. Um, but the majority of patients would be treated uh, in the community um, and, and we would offer a variety of treatments to patients in the community as well as those who come into hospital. We operate um, services in the community for uh, patients living in Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and um, Wiltshire and from neighbouring areas on a patient by patient basis uh, and so patients can be referred um, either through their CMHTs or other mental health services um, or directly from their GPs. For inpatients, um, there is uh, no strong evidence base for any one particular treatment for uh, severe anorexia nervosa, which is what the majority of our admissions are for. Um, so we try to tail, uh, tailor a package of treatment um, to the needs of the individual. Um, and that's likely to involve uh, psychological treatment on both a group basis uh, and an individual basis. It may involve also uh, family therapy, obviously supported eating and psychoeducation around nutrition. Um, occupational therapy becomes increasingly important as somebody restores their weight uh, and wants to have practice in going out to eat, being able to purchase and prepare their own food and make choices around food um, appropriately. Um, medication has some part to play um, and obviously we treat any other uh, mental health problems, uh, depression, anxiety and, and so on. Um, and when somebody first comes in, of course, uh, medication might be more important as somebody might actually be quite physically frail uh, and need quite close observation and um, care about their, their medical condition. Most of our patients will already have a care coordinator in the community if they come into hospital, so um, it's important for us to work closely with the, care, with the care coordinator and the local teams. And some will also have CMHTs as well as specialist eating disorder services working with them in the community. So we try to have CPAs, as I say, every four to six weeks. If people have a long way to come, we can facilitate telephone conferencing so they don't always have to be here in person. Um, and we also send out a weekly update 
um, to the, care, the local care team about the progress of the patient, including risks, looking at risks, capacity, uh, progress towards treatment goals and so on. And with, we liaise by, uh, on the phone on a regular basis um, so that when the patient comes to start having leave, we can plan that so that local services can start to, to see the patient again when he or she is back home on leave before discharge so that we get a good transition. We understand that carers are absolutely fundamental to the care of um, our patients and in helping their loved ones to recover from their eating disorders. So we want to be able to communicate effectively with carers from, from the very beginning. Um, we allocate a secondary nurse as part of the nursing team for an inpatient. There will be a secondary nurse whose responsibility it is to liaise with the carers. We um, encourage patients to invite their carers to come to CPA meetings which are held every four to six weeks. We have a friends and family group um, which meets on a monthly basis and which is open to all uh, carers even if their loved ones are no longer in the service. Um, and we encourage carers to get involved in the planning of therapeutic leave uh, and then make sure that we get their feedback after uh, they come back. Um, some families will also um, benefit from having family therapy, which we can provide. Virtually every patient we've had as an inpatient has gained weight, uh, a very a small number of exceptions to that. Um, as I say, patients may uh, be opting for stabilisation where we're trying to get them to a point at which they can go out and live safely with their eating disorder or they may be aiming to recover from their eating disorder altogether. Um, we, we have found um, that actually a good, a higher um, weight achieved at discharge predicts a better outcome later. Um, and for, for patients who have a higher weight of discharge, the relapse rate can be as low as 10% needing to come back into hospital. Um, our data shows that the patients have a significant reduction in their eating disorder um, ideas and thoughts and symptoms when they leave, as well as an increase in their self-esteem, which is quite fundamental, um, and a reduction in other um, mental health issues such as depression and anxiety in particular. Anorexia nervosa, which is usually what somebody is concerned about with a patient who's refusing treatment, is a mental disorder uh, and is as such subject to the criteria of the Mental Health Act. So it may be appropriate for there to be a Mental Health Act uh, assessment to detain um, the patient. Um, and we do have detained patients at both Cotswold houses um, virtually all of the time. Uh, and occasionally we've had patients who are on community treatment orders um, afterwards. So um, that would be the first thing to consider if a patient isn't willing to come in. Sometimes a patient might be willing to come in for a trial um, of, of an inpatient admission. So we can look at that flexibly to see if that might be um, a way to to help somebody get in, maybe that just that the whole thing's very unfamiliar or frightening and that that's why uh, they're not willing to come. If, if someone refuses to eat, we obviously do our best um, repeatedly to persuade them to eat and we try to get people um, eating again using normal food. Um, if it's not possible to do that, then some people may be f feel able to take a, a food supplement um, instead of a normal meal, um, and we would use that to, um, then as a stepping stone to try to get back to, to normal eating. We'll support people one-to-one -one with their eating if they're having difficulty, because often it can be easier if they're away from the other patients when they're starting off. In a very small minority of, pa of patients, um, we may have to consider using nasogastric feeding, um, but we only use that in about 5-6% to 6 of patients, and it's not primarily to achieve weight gain, it's to try and get over that barrier to eating again, 
uh, and once the patient is able to start either drinking the supplements or eating food again then nasogastric feeding can stop so um, we tend to only use it for maybe a few days to a couple of weeks but not as a long-term treatment but we have found that it's it's better for us to be able to do that on the eating disorder unit on Cotswold House rather than having to send the patient to um, a general hospital for the NG feeding it feels much more contained and safer and less distressing for the patient and better for their continuity of care. It's important for us to have um, a good idea about what um, the patient, the family and the local services um, think about the, what need to be the outcomes from treatment and, and so we always encourage referrers to think about what they want the outcomes to be before they refer the patient in the first place so everyone's clear about what our objectives are. Um, those objectives may need to be modified over time. Sometimes actually patients can go a bit further than the initial objectives um, suggested were achievable. Um, so that's the sort of thing that we would um, review regularly at the CPA meetings, but also by means of, of dialogue in between times uh, when we, we talk to care coordinators and so on on the, on the phone in order to make sure that our treatment goals are aligned with uh, the treatment goals in the community, always bearing in mind that the transition between inpatient care or day patient care and community based treatment is a hard one for patients because it's a big step down sometimes to, to going back to taking all that responsibility back at home and so we try to bridge that gap as much as we possibly can by working closely with the local teams, replicating the meal planning that we're doing here so that people are doing what they've become used to and so on.